Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing? How are you? How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. It's, it's, it's pretty nasty outside right now, though. It is. It is bleeding over where I am, which is... You know, not normal for Dallas, Texas. No, it, we are definitely not ready for anything of this type of precipitation in Dallas, Texas. Uh, like I said, I, I was saying before the show, I would go outside and take pictures of the snow uh, up, up until we had snowmageddon two years ago. And now I just I don't have the desire to go go take pictures in the snow anymore. I just like, OK, <laughs> let's get this thing over with. But it's all good, though. But we got a great show uh, in store today. So uh, without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is an Emmy-winning guitarist and composer whose work has been heard on CSI, Seinfeld, Cheers, and much more. He is also a military supporter whose latest album, Brian Tarquin and Heavy Friends, Brothers in Arms, features songs inspired by the heroes who have sacrificed for our country. Proceeds will go to the Fisher House Foundation, which helps veterans' families. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Brian Tarquin. Hey. hey, Brian, how you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Good, good. We are such an honor to have you with us today. Uh, can you kind of let our no viewers know where you're joining us from today? Oh, sure. Thanks for having me. It's a, uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm coming from Woodstock, New York, and uh, from my studio. So, Man, I've heard stories about Woodstock. I, I, I don't know if we can even <laughs> talk about them on the show, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's an awesome place to be, uh, apparently. Yeah, it's great. It's a great creative area up in the Catskills. Yeah, so we'd like to start off by hearing about Brothers in Arms. So this project is super impressive with a lot of amazing musicians playing on it. Ron from Guns N' Roses. I'm obsessed with Guns N' Roses, so that's so, so exciting. So how did this all come together, um, this album and just the collaboration with all these amazing musicians? You know, I wanted to do something special for um, the veterans, and I wanted to somehow get, you know, attention drawn to it. So I enlisted a bunch of guys that I knew and some I hadn't worked with before and explained the project to them and they they were really down on it and uh, so uh, down to do it so we just did it and uh, what I did is I started to really custom tailor these songs to each person so for Joe Satriani I wrote a, a particular song for him and for uh, Ron I wrote one for him and Vinnie Moore and so forth so you know just to be able to get them um, kind of situated and feel comfortable and add stuff, uh, a creative flavor to the, each song. So, so I see you've done uh, other projects supporting the military. What, what does that passion to support the troops come from? You know, um, my dad was in World War II. He was uh, he served in uh, the South Pacific, and uh, so he kind of he was in the Marines. So he always kind of instilled that upon me. And also, you know, when I was growing up, there was a lot of Vietnam veterans, um, you know, homeless and suffering, and and it didn't seem like at the time in the seventies, no, you know, anyone really cared. So I I wanted to see what I could do, you know, for the military based on what I do creatively. And uh, I also, you know, spent a short stint in uh, the military in the ROTC back in the 80s. So, um, you know, I, I always had a passion for that. Awesome. And so you mentioned your father and uh, he was he was in the Marine Corps. I, I was once a Marine as well. So 
big shout oh. out to my devil dogs out there uh, watching watching the chat. Uh, but he he was a Marine Corps DJ in World War II, um, and yeah, he also worked. He was in community. Oh, oh, so he worked in communication. Yeah, communication at DJ too. Okay, awesome. And so he also worked with Bob and Ray, the comedy duo. Uh, what what kind of stories did he tell you about uh, the, that experience? Oh, that's great. You guys know that because not many people remember those guys. Yeah, he he uh, he liked it. He was in Boston at the time when he was doing it, and um, he, he it was a, a really good comedy team. They were very popular on the radio, so he had a, a lot of uh, you know I think fond memories of all of that. And uh, so before he came to New York, uh, he was doing that in Boston and then kind of radio changed. And so he, he kind of went on to do other things. He was really big into um, big band swing. So that was the era he was from. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so before we go further into your music career, we'd also like to hear about your mother, who was an abstract artist. So what was it like kind of growing up with her and seeing her creative process? You know, that was that was big because, you know, she was an artist. And so, you know, all of the creativeness was in the house. She was always painting and creating and, and having um, shows, you know, uh, in New York City. So... It, it kind of, um, you know, inspired me to be really creative. I guess it's just in my DNA. So I just, um, it, it meant a lot, you know, to, to come from that because they gave me the freedom to, to be able to uh, create and to express myself in that way and whatever I wanted to do. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was a very cool kind of upbringing. Um, you know, with, uh, with art and just creativeness. Oh, awesome. Do you feel like that played a role in your fashion style as well? Cause you have like this super rad hair, we got a headband, like, <laughs> did you have the freedom like, to kind of make your own style too? Yeah, pretty much. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I was, um, when I was a kid growing up, you know, they were there, they were, even though they were creative, they were they were very conservative, so they didn't agree with uh, what you see here. But they they <laughs> liked uh, uh, they they like they like you know um, pretty more conservative stuff and conservative and you know kind of dressing and stuff. But you know it was the era I grew up in, and and uh, you know um, I think in the end of the day they probably didn't didn't mind that much. So. Um, but uh, yeah, they, you know, I went through all sorts of crazy styles and a mohawk at one point in my life when I was a kid and all, all this stuff. So <laughs> and to their chagrin to everything. So I'm, I'm getting paid back by my kids now. So. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, th I think there's like, like there's always this huge generational gap in, in a lot of different things, specifically fashion. I know my son, uh, my oldest son, he he first introduced skinny jeans to my life and i was like why, why would you wear skinny jeans right right now you know whatever the case may be uh because i just i'm older i just don't understand and i grew up in an era where it was all baggy and uh jinko 32 right. inch yeah it was just it was just a whole different vibe and so yeah i think i think that's kind of universal goes down the line of of parents not understanding children or uh, i think will smith and uh jazz jeff had a song parents just 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 don't understand so <laughs> oh yeah i remember that yeah, true <laughs> it, you know it's funny they they kind of why we're always like why are you uh playing you know why are you playing rock why do you listen to rock at the time and then it's funny he my dad told me later that his mother got down on him and why are you listening to jazz so it's <laughs> when he was young yeah. so it's always a general thing absolutely that's awesome. And so um, how much did your parents have to do with your work ethic, which encompasses um, composing, producing, hosting a radio show, writing books and more? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, my my parents were really uh, 
instilled work ethic on me. So it's kind of like they they always had me busy. It's like, you know, I never really had time to idle as a kid. So my mother always kept me going, doing things, you know, whether it be going to Cub Scouts, whether it be going to uh, basketball games, whether it be going, you know, getting involved in school. So it wasn't like they always thought it was healthy for for me to be busy so i guess you know with all of this i just um you know keep going you know i, I keep I, I keep my head to the grindstone and did i never thought i'd i'd be writing books but it, it's an interesting thing you know it's uh and you always got to keep yourself busy you know i always think as an artist if if you actually um you know, keep idle, you kind of like stagnate your creativity. So I thought, well, you know, the more things I get involved with musically and just with with my career, the better it, it, it is in the outcome of the whole thing. And you also you also work in several styles of music. So uh, what, what kind of led you? And you mentioned uh, your parents asking you, like, why do you why do you like rock and roll? But uh, what, what led you to have such eclectic taste? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I was always an instrumentalist. It probably came from listening to all those records my growing up with my dad, because, uh, you know, all that big band stuff so I'm instrumental. And so I liked what was going on in the early 90s mid 90s with jazz like the acid jazz movement the contemporary jazz movement which then morphed into the smooth jazz movement and i i felt like it was just an extension of what i could do anyway and so i dove into that and uh, you know by the early 90s rock was kind of like you know i i wouldn't say dying but it was kind of like not mainstream so much any longer and uh so i like the refreshness of the uh the hip-hop grooves that i was hearing like out of england with uh guitarists like ronnie jordan and uh you know other ass bands like the brand new heavies and and so i i kind of like created you know got into this uh creation of making the you know, the guitar, the main instrument and, you know, collectively working with sax player and keyboardists. And so it was a it was a, you know, definitely a fun time, you know, of doing that. And then, you know, as I moved on, I I I felt myself getting, you know, stagnated with it after, you know, three, four records. So I moved on to doing other other albums and, you know, simultaneously, I was doing I was always composing for television. So I was seeing different uh, musical things that I was actually creating to be able to work for television. Uh, like I had this this uh, this kind of project called Asphalt Jungle, which was kind of a rock electronica thing. And and that worked really well. And so, you know, you know, I've been actually also producing the past couple of years lo fi music as well, which has become very popular. And, uh, you know, I like to jump around the formats because, you know, I think, you know, guitar, you know, I love many guitars. I love George Benson. I love Jimi Hendrix, Van Halen, you know, uh, Lee Rittenauer. So, I mean, I think that you don't have to, you know, be kind of settled in one style of music. Now, now I do have one more question, uh, kind of, I just thought it of in my head. What's the, what's the hair length requirement for guitars? Because it seems like most of the guitars that I know they, they have they have a good pretty good grade of hair and they have to have a, a certain length. Uh, it's pretty you know I've, I'm just thinking back to uh, what's his slash and just all these different guitars all right. that are out there in the world and uh, all of them seem to have a lot of hair. So is there is there a hair requirement? Do I do how many years do I need to to go to start my guitar career? <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, that's funny because uh, it it always seemed like that in the old days. Um, I think today it doesn't matter any longer. But, you know, it was uh, at least two feet. I'm not really sure in, in, in the 80s. <laughs> no, but speaking of composing, what have you found to be some of the differences in composing for television and movies versus composing for an album? 
Oh, yeah, that's a great question because, you know, you have a lot of uh, different uh, ingredients in that because, you, you know, with, with film and television, you actually um, have a music supervisor, producer, director, and they're, they're kind of dictating what you what their vision is and what you should be doing to get that vision. So you're kind of like on, you know, you have margins there and you have a, a direction to be able to follow with, um, you know, composing for television and film uh, to, to get their vision that they're looking for. Now with, um, you know, uh, an album, that is really what I would say more of an open creative moment. So you can do whatever you really want, what you want to express, where your vision of the song is going to be. You're not being so much like a work for hire, like you would with a uh, film and television, that you're actually doing your own thing and, you know, expressing yourself in your music. You know, there are some formats I found with smooth jazz as it moved on, there was a lot of restrictions on, on the singles because they, we're getting more and more marginalized to be able to get the airplay. But generally that's, that's kind of the way I, I've, I've always seen it. And you've collaborated with so many artists. So who is still on your bucket list that you would love to work with? Oh man, that's a great question. You know, actually <laughs> the guy I really wanted to work with actually just passed away, Jeff Beck. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, unfortunately, but um, also Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. I'd love to work with him. Um, and of course, another guy I wanted to work with passed away too, Van Halen. So um, it seems like everybody's, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of getting older and passing away that, uh, that I, that I want to work with. Uh. Yeah, and, and you mentioned earlier in the interview about instrumentals and how it used to be so common uh, on the top 40 back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, but you kind of rarely hear them on the mainstream now. So uh, what do you think uh, happened or why did you think they went away from top 40? Uh, one question, and the second question is, what's your favorite classic instrumental? Yeah, you know, uh, um... It, that's a good question about the uh, what happened to instrumental music. It's funny. I was talking to Jan Hammer uh, once, and he said, "You know, it's a shame that instrumental music has has kind of like taken a back burner. It used to be a lot more common. Um, one of the reasons I got into contemporary jazz back in the '90s and and uh, which was smooth jazz is because it was a popular instrumental format." which there was nothing else that you could listen to, at least on the radio. Um, today, I, I, I think, you know, because, you know, I think computer be is, is come into being a strong, I, I think, um, instrument in itself with the younger generation. You know, there's less of uh, musical, I think, prowess, if you will. And, and I think maybe they're not looking at practicing so much any longer when it's so easy to create music you know with with all the loops and all the pre-performances you have today that come with a computer uh but you know what i think it'll come back you know whatever's you know what what's old is new again and it'll probably somehow research back you know and maybe the next generation will we'll discover wow there was some cool instrumental music back then um as far as what's my favorite um i have to say you know one of my favorites was third stone from the sun from uh jimmy hendrix that is such a great track um and jimmy was so far ahead of his time he was just miles beyond this galaxy to you know i don't and no one's even come close to that uh since jimmy um and another one probably you know freeway jam by jeff beck So we did speak about Jeff Beck um, a second ago, but how much did he really influence your um, music talent, like your ability, and how much did his music affect you in general? Yeah, Jeff, he was, you know, I, I really enjoyed Jeff. You know, he came from the Yardbirds in the 60s, and then he had his own Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood from the Stones. And then 
he moved into, you know, what I call that magical period of time in the 70s when he did those incredible albums like Blow by Blow, Wired, There and Back. And they were just amazing records because he was so, f another one far ahead of his time. And he was really um, kind of gave the blueprint to what, um, you know, what guitar rock instrumental was going to be. He, it, it was interesting because he really, he took the rock side, but he also brought in the jazz side. And he really, what, what I said, the perfect combination of fusion. Um, and it was all instrumental. Uh, before I heard those records, I didn't even know that you could do that, you know, that that actually was something that people liked, you know, just guitar instrumental. But, you know, those those records were seriously, you know, influential on me. And, um, you know, Jeff had an amazing tone. He had, he had uh, so many things. And uh, it, it's it's staggering his, you know, 50, 60, 70 year career, you know, what he did and how many artists he worked with and how many things that he played on. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And who are some young and up, up and coming artists and musicians that um, we should know more about? You know, there's one guy that I really like. He's from Germany, and he's in a band called Son of a Bach. His name is Johannes Wieck, and he's a great guitarist. And uh, I had him on two tracks on this record, on Brothers in Arms, because I really was impressed with his playing, and he was just great, and he's just a young kid. And you don't find, you know, 20-year-olds really into the music that we used to like and uh, especially rock because you know rock now you know has become you know what i think the younger generation thinks the music of their grandparents and i you know it kind of didn't translate to them and i, and I kind of understand that you know listen you know it's 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 you know a generational thing um you know i i, I a funny story is that i when i was a kid in the 70s teenager my my dad came into my room and i have all these posters of led zeppelin and the stones and and you know uh the who and everything and he comes into me and he says listen i've been thinking about it i think you should take up the clarinet it's easier to carry <laughs> and uh <laughs> and you won't have an amp or uh your guitar and i and i was in a band at the time and i thought my god even if I wanted to take up the clarinet, I'd have nobody to play with because none of the contemporary music even has horns in it, let alone clarinet. So, you know, it's just kind of like that. You know, I, I tried to instill, like, when my kids were younger, I said, listen, why don't you, you know, because they, you know, kids today, it's it's different. They seem bored and they're on their phone. I said, why don't you guys start a band, you know? And they looked at me probably the way I, my dad looked at me when he asked me to play the clarinet. So... <laughs> Yeah. For some reason, I'm, I'm looking at you and I can't see you playing the clarinet for a living. I, I just, you, you just yeah. don't, the aesthetics just don't. <laughs> I don't think there'd be enough gigs. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. So we also want to hear about your radio show, Guitar Tracks. Uh, which some of our audience can hear over the air at WFIT 89.5 on Florida's uh, Space Coast. And everyone can hear on Spotify. So yeah, can you give us a little uh, a little rundown about the guitar tracks? Yeah, sure. Um, that was a funny thing that I came up with. You know, how the whole thing developed is was that I, I uh, had uh, written for Premier Guitar Magazine years and years ago, and I had all these these interviews, and I thought, well, you know what'd be cool is that, um, you know, when I had moved down to Florida um, back in 2014, I said, you know, it'd be cool. Maybe maybe uh, I'll just go and, uh, you know, see if the radio station, a local NPR, might be interested in something like this, and, you know, um, I waited around a while because, you know, once they, once those spots get taken. It's like you need an act of Congress or death to be able to get a spot on a radio station. So um, I guess 
you know, once the spot became available, they gave me my show and I, it, the guy was really into it and all these uh, interviews that I had. And so I started interviewing more and more people. And so it's a two hour show. And what I do is I concentrate on instrumental guitar music. So I'll play everything. I'll play a George Benson piece. You know, I'll play, I'll, I'll play Herbie Hancock. I'll play, um, you know, a Van Halen instrumental piece. I'll play, you, you know, Metallica slash. I'll play, you know, Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, uh, Larry Correa. And so I wound up, you know, interviewing a lot of these guys and we had a great rapport. And uh, when I was down in Florida, I actually worked with Larry Coriel before he died and, uh, and had a great interview with him. And uh, I really enjoyed it because there's, there's not really, like you said earlier, there's not really an outlet, um, at least commercially or on the air, you, you know, for instrumental music. And so I like to play all eras of instrumental music. I'll play Les Paul too, and you know, and all these guys. And I, I like, you know, I, I just like the mix of it, you know, just people can discover, hey, I didn't know, you know, he did a song like that or they did a song like this. And, um, you know, and everything from jazz, I'll play even acoustic, new age stuff. And uh, I just, uh, you know, it, it just was a passion that I, that I actually took off and I just started doing. We do want to turn to our live feed and read a few comments um, and questions for you. So Marie, sure. oh, I'm sorry. Chris says, did you ever envision winning an Emmy and what did that mean to you? Yeah, you know, I never did because I never thought, you know, as a, as growing up and and, and kind of in their, in their 20s, you kind of didn't think about you know, an Emmy for music, you know, you kind of thought, well, the Grammys are for music and then the Emmys seemed like they were for acting and the Oscars were for acting. Yeah. You never really kind of like put all together. And, uh, and that was just, you know, a, a thing that timing, you know, it was the right time, the right place. I was with the right, you know, uh, show and they, and they got the, uh, the Emmy for it and, uh, you know, the, for the composing. And it was, it was, it was, uh, uh, really cool you know it was pretty awesome I, you know was, I, you know something like that i never even uh, could imagine that and uh it just uh it's it's it happened a couple times and and so it, it was really uh you know quite mind-blowing and and you know it, it's it's one of those things that you know kind of almost gives you validity of what you're doing too not even for anybody else but for yourself like oh okay i guess i chose the right thing to do <laughs> so no, that's awesome. And also, I'm sure you can brag with your peers too, because your peers probably don't have an Emmy as well. So if you're like, well, do you, do you have an Emmy? <laughs> 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 yeah. No, and also, Robert looks great. says. No, also, and Robert says, Third Stone Rocks. Stevie Ray Bond did a good version of it too. Have you heard that version? Yes, yeah, I love C. Ray Vaughn. C. Ray Vaughn was one of my favorites. And yes, uh, his version is incredible. And, and everything he did that covered um, Jimi Hendrix was was awesome. I mean, it was just uh, his version of Voodoo Child is great. It was like, you know, this spirit was coming through uh, C. Ray Vaughn's hands. It's uh, definitely, you know, uh, pretty memorable and also you know uh not a lot of people know but steve ray Vaughan had a lot of really good instrumentals like um lenny and um uh, riviera and all, all these in incredible songs nice so also um fisher house foundation is tuned in and they say good morning and then marie says um god bless you for mentioning our vietnam vets um and she is a widow of a soldier but um her dad also served in the military too, so she thanks you for shouting out our veterans. Oh, it was great. You know, I did a I did a big search on on a company and and a benefit that would actually give you know most of the proceeds to um, 
you know, to the veterans and everything. And, and, you know, it was a, a long search talking to different, uh, you know, companies and, and uh, foundations. And though I, I like the Fisher House Foundation, you know, um, uh, Fisher, who started it, was, you know, a philanthropist, a patriot. And he, I think it was in 91, early 90s, he, he brought this whole thing together, of giving housing to veterans while they were going through, uh, veterans' families while they were going through, um, you know, uh, hospitalizations. And I thought, wow, this is such a meaningful thing to, to do because, you know, so many veterans obviously need hospitalization. They need, uh, you know, uh, medical treatment. And it's great. I, I really, I really like that. Well, yeah, huge shout out to the Fisher House, um, specifically the one at Keesler Air Force Base. I got a chance to to frequent that one. Um, I had uh, LASIK surgery um, back probably in 2003 at Keesler Air Force Base, and I got a chance to stay in the Fisher House facility while I was recovering. So uh, just big shout out to Fisher House. They they do so much for the military community, and um, we're glad they, they are a part of it, and we're glad you're a part of their organization as well. Oh, great. It's, it's a uh, honor. Absolutely. And uh, you're pretty active online and social media because uh, a lot of our guests, uh, they have social media platforms, but they're not really that active on it. So uh, you're you're very active on yours. So where, where can we find out more about you and your, your causes? Um, you can go to uh, uh, my website, you know, bryantarquin.com. Um, my label to bhpmusic.com. Uh, you know, there is also a link that you can directly donate to the Fisher House Foundation under the album. Um, I try, you know, it's funny, I don't really uh, think myself that active, but I guess to my generation, I'm probably more active than most people, but you know, because it took me a long time. <laughs> So we don't we don't have you on TikTok yet, do we? No, I'm. <laughs> my kids are all over that, but I, I figure that out. Gotcha. So for our Chief Chat viewers, uh, you can find this episode as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube. Uh, tune in at the special time of three thirty p.m. on February seventh, when our guest will be TikTok sensation Austin Snell. He's a grunge country singer who served in the Air Force. At 11 a.m. February 21st, our guest will be author Reed Mittenbuehler, who will talk about his upcoming novel, Wanderlust, an eccentric explorer and epic journey, a lost age. So, Brian, we had a, a great conversation uh, with you and, and, and getting to know you better. And, and I just want to thank you for for sharing your art form with the world, because uh, music is able to connect with people in so many different ways. And, uh, you know, and, and Knowing that you were, you know, you had your hand in some 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 stuff that I heard on Cheers growing up, or or Seinfeld, or or whatever the case may be, man, that's that these are these are sitcoms that are last a generation, and of course your music itself will last a long after you're 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 gone. So just thank you for for you know take you know making the most out of your art form uh, while you're here, and, and just thank you so much for spending time with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having on me. Thanks for absolutely, having absolutely. me on. Sorry. Oh, no, no problem. And, and if you don't mind hanging on until after the live is over with, so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But I just want to, like I said, yeah. tell you thank you uh, while we're on the show and just appreciate your time. Uh, and, and I know you're about to, you say you're about to make a big move to another state here uh, soon. So uh, many blessings and safe travels as you as you uh, depart one location and go to the next. Oh, thanks. I, you guys understand that. I have a, actually, you know, it's funny. My cousin is a colonel in the army. He's actually going to be stationed in, um, he's coming from Germany and going to be stationed in Texas. I think, oh, wow. uh, okay. I forget what, which, which uh, air, uh, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll, I'll write you, but, it, it, but he's going to go down there in June. Actually, he's leaving Germany and then he's going to, yeah, if, he, he's if he's army, so yeah, if he's army, he's either going to San Antonio, uh, Fort Sam Houston's got a big hospital there, or Fort Hood. Fort Hood is uh, where most people go in the in the army. It, yeah, yeah, I think it's Fort Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 
that's a huge, huge installation. I just got a chance to go check that out uh, a few months ago. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's a, a mass, massive, massive uh, organization down there at Fort Hood. But again, thank you so much. Uh, and it, if you like I said, if you don't mind hanging on to after the chat's over with, um, we'll say our formal goodbyes. But uh, thank you so much. And, and, and Chief Chat out. Uh, thank you for supporting it. Thank you. And thank you, guys.